The cabinet of curiosities that John Tredeskin built up in his house in Lambeth became a must-see destination for visitors to London. Tredeskin himself was seen as a contemporary Noah and his collection was affectionately nicknamed the Ark. With their cabinet of curiosities, the Tredescans built up a snapshot of their world. And through their collection, we can read their interests, anxieties and peculiar fascinations and share the sheer exhilaration of being alive in a world that had suddenly grown bigger through global trade and exploration. This is a really good example of that great excitement of global travel. John Trudeskin Jr. said that this was the mantle of the King of Virginia. He meant, of course, Powhatan, the leader or chief of the Algonquin tribes. But we probably know Powhatan better as the father of Pocahontas. Now, we don't know where the Tredescans got this mantle. We don't know whether this is a mantle at all. It's probably more likely to be a ceremonial wall hanging. And in fact, we don't quite know whether this has anything to do with Powhatan. But this we know, that when Pocahontas was brought over to England and wined and dined by royalty, people would have been desperate to get a glimpse of the world that she had come from. So people would have thronged to the Tredescans' cabinet of curiosity to see this mantle, have a little bit of that new world literally within their reach. In fact, if you look carefully, you can see little bits of the mantle where people have plucked out cowrie shells. Of course, this is long before our time when museum objects have been vacuum sealed away from visitors' hands. The story of how John Tredescan's curiosities found their way into one of the most renowned museums in the world is a dark tale of duplicity and one-upmanship. When John Tredescan Jr. decided to print a catalogue to publicise their collection, he made one big mistake. He enlisted the help of his neighbour, Elias Ashmole, a shrewd lawyer who was an even more determined social climber than he was. Ashmole understood the kudos that went with a well-known and really extensive collection. He had amassed quite an impressive cabinet of curiosities himself, but he had his eyes on the much better known and much more extensive collection of his neighbours, the Tredescans. Ashmole paid for the publication of John Tredescan's catalogue. So although it was published under the Tredescans' name, Ashmole was already beginning to associate himself with the collection. When Tredescan Jr. died, he left his collection to his wife, with instructions that on her death it should be given to Oxford or Cambridge University. Ashmole seized his chance. He approached Oxford University about gifting them the Tredescan collection, with two provisors. Firstly, that it should be housed in a purpose-built new museum, and secondly, that it should be open to the public. But in doing so, Elias Ashmole was styling himself ever so subtly as both the owner and the donor of this collection. When Tredescan's widow died two years later, Ashmole moved quickly, taking out a lease on Tredescan's home and taking possession of the collection it contained. It took Oxford University six years to complete the impressive new home for the Tredescans' treasures. But on the 21st of May 1683, the building finally opened its doors and became the first purpose-built public museum in the world. The new building was named not after the Tredescans, whose collection of curiosities it housed, but the Ashmolean Museum, after Elias Ashmole. His grand plan was complete. Ashmole died without an heir, 
but his name is very much with us. As his epitaph states, as long as the Ashmolean Museum endures, he will never die. All of Tradescan's wonders were now accessible to everyone who could pay the sixpence entry fee. One early visitor enthused, the Ashmolean is absolutely the best collection of such rarities that I have ever beheld. But not everyone took kindly to a load of ordinary people wandering around in search of easy entertainment. One aristocrat, visiting on market day, complained the museum was full of all sorts of country folk. Worse still, even women were allowed in. They run here and there, grabbing at everything, he grumbled. But the museum's opening coincided with the cooling off of our love affair with the Cabinet of Curiosities. The cabinet with its marvellous monstrosities was at odds with the new 17th century spirit of enlightenment. This was a period obsessed with systematic order and classification. The once-loved cabinet became seen as a chaotic freak show, and many private collections were donated to modern museums. In these new, well-ordered exhibition spaces, the antique was set apart from the contemporary, the natural wonders from the artificial, and the dizzying variety of the cabinet was rationally rearranged like with like. But there's something about the cabinet that we could never quite leave behind. I think it's the tantalizing contradiction that lies at its heart. On the one hand, there's that urge to categorize and understand the world. But on the other, there's that equally strong urge to experience wonder for the world to defy our understanding. While modern museums cater for that appetite for education and knowledge, contemporary curators and artists are responding to our yearning for wonder, borrowing from the cabinet's startling juxtaposition of objects to force us to look at the world with fresh eyes. From the shocking physicality of Damien Hirst's animals in formaldehyde displayed in tanks, to Polly Morgan's reinvention of taxidermy, creating unsettling pieces that are both familiar and strange. And Grayson Perry's clever curation at the British Museum, mixing age-old artifacts with new pieces of his own. But perhaps the most deliberate appropriators of the cabinet are London artists, the Connor brothers. Their cabinet-themed show contained new works that are a puzzling blend of fact and fiction. Fellow cabinet lover Philip Hall joined me to explore their disconcerting wonder room. Dolphin. <laughs> Whale dolphin. I can't quite work out what that is actually. False killer whale, is that false killer whale mashed up with a bottlenose dolphin? It's got that weird skull, I mean, I don't yeah. know any cetacean has a skull like that. Actually, it's been turned on its end. Oh, look, there's teeth marks, look. Oh, there's, right. There's pockets, look. So it's been, <laughs> they've mashed something onto the top of it. Goodness, look at that. Oh, what's that? <laughs> a, a gold, gold plated. Gold plated? Oh, Pablo Escobar's gold plated hippopotamus skull. Can you believe that? 
<laughs> I'd love to believe it. It's a good story, isn't it? I, I guess so. <laughs> if you're going to have a gold-plated hippopotamus skull, it should belong to a Colombian cocaine baron, I think. A absolutely, and I love the notion that they imported hippos to Colombia. But that's the good thing about these collections of curiosities, isn't it? Each object has to have a story. Yeah. And I don't know if we sometimes wonder or does it even matter whether it's true or not? I don't think it does, does it? I mean, it's, it's what's been invested in that object, isn't it? It's what it's been charged with, this mm. kind of a, a narrative. So why do you think contemporary artists are so fascinated with the idea of cabinets of curiosity? There's so much in the last decade or so that plays with that concept. I think it's looking back to a period before art became digital and conceptual, mm. back to the real object. I mean, I think in a way it started with Damien Hirst with those tanks, you know, and there couldn't be anything more more of a, an extraordinary take on the cabinet for curiosities is the physical impossibility of death in the mind yeah. of someone living, the, the hearse, the shark. Yeah. Suddenly you're face to face, mouth to mouth with this leviathan, this beast. Mm. Um, we weren't used to seeing things like that in a museum, say, yeah. in a gallery situation. Uh, and of course, addressing no, notions of mortality as well. One of the things that always fascinates me about cabinets of curiosity is that they have a real obsession with death. Absolutely, and it's the memento mori, isn't mm. it? It's the notion of what something is speaking of your own mortality. It's challenging your mortality. It's showing you, uh, you know, this is a mirror yeah. held up to you. But I suppose it's also strangely comforting then if you have a cabinet where you're collecting these things. They're little fragments of mm. existence mm. that you're shoring mm. up against the passage of time. I think that's a really good point. It's almost as though you close the doors on your own mortality. <laughs> carefully controlled and shut away, you know, with these strange things. Back in the 16th century, cabinets of curiosity allowed bold adventurers to make sense of the wonders they were discovering. Today, modern technology has turned us all into collectors. With mobile phones, we snap up the places we've been, the weird and wonderful things we've seen, even the food we eat. Through Instagram and Pinterest, we curate our own lives. And just like those early collectors, we present the things that make us appear as interesting and well-traveled as possible. Every cabinet of curiosity was a miniature universe and each collector curated his own individual version. So every cabinet told a story not just about the world, but about the collector himself. So in some ways, these dusty, eccentric, antique collections tell us a story that is startlingly modern, that there is no singular truth about the world, just many different stories, seen through many different eyes. More secret knowledge here on BBC4 next this evening with a trip to the Cairngorms in the footsteps of writer Nan Shepherd in just a few moments. Then at nine, from the sublime to the totally abstract, how Picasso's love for the female body became central to his life and work in love, sex and art. Stay with us.